Well, hello there, friends. Thank you for joining Chris and I. My name is Brian Cumming. This is the seventh online coaching session I've hosted. Let me just get the right video up. Speak of you. Ah. Um, this is the seventh online coaching session I've hosted. It looks like it should be the most hectic so far. So much information, so little time. But rest assured, everyone who's booked on will get the video link to watch it again and again. Even in 20 years' time, when Chris and I are just reminiscing about having hair, so we'll, be able to come, we'll, we'll still be able to come back to it then. I'm so very grateful to see uh, so many faces staring back at me. Um, the regular faces and all the new people and all the people watching this at a later date too. To you guys, hello, how are you? No need to reply, I can't hear you, this is a recording, silly. I'm also excited too, it's encouraging to know that every single one of you watching this has invested in your safety. Brilliant, and who doesn't want to be a better, safer skydiver? You'd be surprised. Um, during this class, hopefully you won't learn anything. Hopefully it will all be a refresher from what you knew before, but skill fade is real. What was once second nature can become forgotten, and that's why you and I are here. Um, now, we called this safety hour, but in reality, given the content, it's going to take 60 to 90 minutes. We're provisionally aiming for 75 minutes of information and 15 minutes of Q&A. I really don't want to go over 90 minutes, and if we have to cut the Q&A short, we will do that. If that happens, Chris and I will get on Zoom during the week, and we'll answer any questions we don't get around to and post that video online too. Don't worry, we're doing everything we can to make you a better, safer skydiver. Over the past seven weeks, these classes have been raising money for trees for the future. 25% of the revenue for this class goes straight to them. So far, we've raised enough to plant around about 7,000 trees, which is pretty fucking cool. Um, Chris introduced the charity to me and his mantra uh, is one jump, one tree. And when you consider that it's $10, 10 US dollars to plant 100 trees, that seems like something we can all make happen. 150 jumps a year, that's only 15 US dollars. Think about it. We are super grateful for the companies who, let me share my screen. Sweet, like safety day, but shorter. Cool, so we are super grateful for the companies that are supporting us tonight. Um, we've got some giveaways, Visionary, very, very kind. So unsurprisingly, with Chris being here, we've got four prizes. We've got a t-shirt, we've got a jumper, and we've got two people gonna get buffs. Uh, extreme in keeping with the theme of the class we're gonna have a three free pack of closing loops a chest leg pack of chest and leg strap bungees and a t-shirt of your choice from xdsports.uk and symbiosis suit manufacturer also with safety as a theme 50 percent off an aluminium hook knife with a custom pouch um, the winners are going to be chosen at random i have the order in which you signed up to this class here uh, and everyone has been assigned a number i'll bring up a random number generator on screen and it could be you we plan to run this draw at the very end of the q and I'm using, um, I've used a bit of a deadline to get everyone on here. So last few people might not be on it, sorry. Um, we're gonna take a group photo at the start of the q and So be prepared to have a t-shirt on Papa G, although trousers not required. Okay, rules for this evening. We've got 90 minutes and we're aiming to finish on time or earlier. I know a few of you have places to go and things to do, tunnel time to book and weather forecasts to watch. As the Zoom meeting host, only myself and Chris can unmute people. Um, bear with us, but the content is why you're here, so we want to avoid distractions. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Feel free to type your question into the chat function and your question will be one of the first to be answered. It would be great if you could put it in the shared chat so that everyone can see it. If you're thinking it, someone else is thinking it too. Anything sent privately will be treated as anonymous. Ah, sweet. Ryan, if I'm rabbiting on too long, can you mute me? Uh, well, we've got a little thing about that. I was going to get to that in a bit. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up. I <laughs> uh, lost my spot. Uh, okay, rules for the ceiling, done that bit. Cool, okay, so safety hour. Myself, Brian Cumming, and Chris Sears. Chris has only been jumping for six years, but he's been going at it hard and he's done doing four to 500 jumps a year. So he's hoping to hit his 3,000th this year. He's been jumping all over the world with some excellent coaches and mentors. He's the driving force behind Visionary. And more than anything, he wants to be an old skydiver. Now, what that means is firstly, safe, alive and injury free. Secondly, it means fun. 
it has to be fun or it won't or he won't be jumping and thirdly it means sustainable skydiving isn't great for the environment so what can we do to reduce or remove the impact on the planet the concept arose of increasing awareness by creating and growing the community of skydivers caring for the planet and visionary is how he plans to do that and his mantra one jump one tree there are quite a few other people doing similar things but chris wanted to keep it simple one jump, one tree is a commitment he's asking skydivers to make and to lead from the front at all of his visionary events. They have committed to planting three trees for every jump. Uh, it should be noted that trees for the future don't just plant trees. They do other great things too. Chris has been an AFF instructor for a couple of years now. And since the lockdown, he has been running and coordinating the Sipson and Beckles video refreshes, which made him a natural choice to join me this evening. Uh, the drawback being that Chris and I both like to talk so we've agreed that we won't be offended if either of us G's the other person along. We've settled on a movie reference. It's originally a 60s movie. It was remade for the 80s. And both movies are a cult classic. The movie is Dragnet. And the quote is, just the facts, ma'am. Uh, I wonder how many times we're going to be saying that to each other. The facts. Just the facts, yeah, ma'am. Cool. Chris, thanks for being here, buddy. Welcome. Thanks no, for trimming the hair on half of your head in an attempt to look more professional. Appreciate yeah. that. You, you even combed yours this evening. I, I did, I did, yeah. I spoke to Brian earlier on and his looked like he'd been dragged through a hedge back, so you're looking very professional as well. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me, mate. Um, it's been, um, yeah, it's been, I've been doing a few of these for the Sibson lot. Um, and I'm still probably making mistakes and missing bits off, so we'll probably miss miss bits off on this um if we do like brian said we'll try and uh, we'll try and catch up um before you go on a bit further chris before you go into the, the the bulk of it i've just got to remind people why they are here um we had a bit of a miscommunication with our uh, timings of our uh, right rehearsal later this afternoon but it's all good so you are here for people folks you are here for a refresh on everything you knew in 2019 but might now have forgotten uh, the pandemic and the lockdowns played havoc with our lives, our hobbies, our income, our physical and mental health. But finally, the UK is coming out of restrictions in a limited and guarded manner, and we can get back to the best therapy we know, the sky. This session is aimed at mostly at people with a B license and above, but it's still 90% valid for anyone below that too. It's just that some sections such as jump master duties won't make much sense. You can't be refreshed on what you haven't been taught yet, but we're very glad that you're here. Just to let you know, uh, we are both current British skydiving AFF instructors. Um, this class is not an exhaustive list of everything. It is to the best of our knowledge, uh, but I'm sure there's gonna be, if we said it was everything, then I'm sure some of you pop up with it. Um, you have all done at least one skydive. So we're assuming you have a certain level of intelligence and common sense to have survived to be here. And obviously by being here and watching this, you are demonstrating a superior level of intelligence than the common person that we walk among. But don't get complacent. Uh, and please don't sue us if you die on your first jump back. You don't sue me. <laughs> we are going to run through as much as we can think of that you need to know. Uh, we've decided that the order of it is that we want to arrive at the drop zone and jumping. So let me show you the quick order. So um, keep it simple. Before you've left for home, at the drop zone, on a call, walk into the plane, in the plane, in free fall, under canopy, landing area, packing, Q and A at the end, and the group, group photo on prizes. Okay, cool. Chris, if you want to head on with a bit of your introduction and then kiss me, please. Cool. Um, yeah, no, I think, like Brian said, we've, we've tried to keep a rough order. He's going to slap me back onto track if I'm going off it, so I'm prepared to be slapped a few times. Um, first thing, like Brian said, is I think, We've, we've had a long period off, but people have long periods off um, without having the COVID situation. So, and um, I think because of the COVID situation, like I've never seen this many people on a Zoom, on a Zoom day, like we had maybe this number of people, I don't know how many people are here. So like almost 50 people, we had this kind of number of people at the Simpson Safety Day this year or last year. So it's like kind of, it's amazing that everyone's here and basically thank you for um that's the first step of kind of being safe i think is turning up to these sorts of things so i think that's a really good thing um 
sky the, the principles that like the fundamentals haven't changed like we're still jumping out of a plane we still need to kind of do the basics really well and um, there are obviously still a few like Brian's already said but there's still a few different changes um, with the COVID things which we'll try and cover in a bit um, when we try and use this time now like you guys clearly are using this time like wisely now and um, before you get to the drop zone spend that time kind of really visualizing mentally preparing going through all your kit packing um, you don't want to be doing that when you get to the drop zone okay um on brian's talk a couple of weeks ago he talked uh, he was the one one of the ones with pete allen he mentioned um pete kind of spends like if people don't know pete allen he's got more jumps than most of us have had hot dinners and if he can spend time at the start of every day whether it's a jumping day or a coaching day thinking a little bit about um bits that how he how he visualizes the day going then we for sure should be doing it as well okay um and um not only does he think about the bits which he's fairly confident will go right but think about the bits which may be different or may kind of go a little bit off track um to how he kind of sees it going okay so try and use this time as best we can um and again do that before it sounds stupid but set aside like set aside like a cup of tea every other day and like sit there and drink the cup of tea and use that as the time that you're going to use to to really concentrate on it i don't know how long like to me that's kind of quite a useful time if you sit there and just drink a cup of tea sit there enjoy the cup of tea or coffee or whatever you want to drink or a beer and uh and then use that time to to mentally rehearse what you're going over and um, don't wait until you get to the dz to go oh i should have really used that time to what am i going to do if i have a have like super high high twists or what happens if i'm going to have a premature break fire like you don't want to be turning up to the drop zone and thinking that and you certainly don't want to be thinking that when it's happened you want to have thought all of those processes and um and kind of mentally rehearse them okay keep it simple like um don't try not to go and jump at a different drop zone like some drop zones are opening up before others try and jump at your um your kind of familiar drop zones try not to jump new kit um jump a different like a, a more complex jump than certainly don't try and do a more complex jump than you were doing before the lockdown um and just keep it as simple as possible keep it simple stupid um we'll cover more later on i'll let brian take over i think i think that's pretty much all the points covered if i unless i've missed something shout cool um thanks chris uh the basics the are uh, basics you know in free fall you have to pull you need a canopy and the basics in under canopy you have to land under a flat and level canopy if you do those two things Pretty much everything else is kind of optional or it doesn't you can get away without doing them uh, there's lots of important stuff but those are the two most critical things uh, but then you add in everything else as well um, the other three four priorities not only do you need to pull but you you really ought to be pulling at the right height and you really ought to be pulling at the right height whilst you're stable and then once you're under canopy under a good canopy you're not just landing under a flat level canopy but you want to land into a hazard free area and you want to land preferably into wind, but not at the expense of the other two. And you want to land whilst the canopy is fully flared. Chris. Oh well, yeah, um, there's quite a lot of talk. Um, I can't remember it was last year or the year before about malfunctions. And um, and sticking to the sticking to kind of like the super basics of going going back to AFF asking yourself the questions not just kind of like going is it big is it square is it there can i land it can i control it really ask yourself the questions and if the answer to any of those is no then it's a malfunction there's been fatalities or a number of fatalities or serious injuries by people trying to sort twists out trying to sort um tension knots out and using burning that altitude okay altitude your friend like use it wisely have a good look at your canopy make sure your canopy control do your canopy control checks make sure you know in clear airspace and then um and then execute your mouth your, your mouse drills if you can Chris, you're breaking up, you buddy. execute your what did you get if there's a question if there's a question there's no question do you uh, do your reserve drills did you get that bit no i didn't but we did then thank you <laughs> cool 
Okay, if that, if we're, we're going to keep an eye on Chris's uh, internet. It's been a bit unstable this evening. If it does happen two or three, a third time, let's say, then uh, we'll, switch to, we'll switch him off because we've seen his pretty face enough. Okay, so the first bit for me starts, what are you going to do before you've left home? That's where this all starts. Um, try all your regular kit on. Uh, shout out to Neil. I just saw him sitting in his rig. Well, I think he's taking it off now. Uh, he's got a hat on instead. Um, it might feel embarrassing. It might feel a bit weird, but there's nothing like putting on your kit on to help you get back into the jumping mindset and you'll spot possible issues before it's too late, before you're out of the drop zone. Um, practice putting on your face covering. We're all going to be wearing them now, your buff or mask or whatever you want, but put it on, practice it, and then put your helmet on and off and on and off and on and off a couple of times. Is the method you're using to put it on the best method? Or is it going to cover your eyes? Um, don't be the fool learning this for the first time on a 10 minute call. It's not, it's not cool. It's a really good video. Um, there's a really good video by Laura Hampton from Chimera, one of the forward teams based out of Skydive Langer. I'm going to link to that in the email you get uh, today or the one on Wednesday with the catch up video link. Check your batteries. You know, uh, maybe you've got a digital altimeter, maybe you've got a digital audible, um, maybe you've got cameras, everything needs charging um, or replacing. Uh, maybe even your AAD. Hopefully, you checked that before. It might take a while. Uh, repack your main parachute. Seriously, try it out. If you haven't packed the, if it hasn't been packed for six months, the bungees might be a problem. They can deteriorate over time. And if they snap at the wrong time on deployment, it can contribute to a hard opening. Um, just have a quick look at the closing loops and your the loops on your three rings and everything, in fact. Um, just do a proper hands on check. You know, be comfortable before you've left home. Um, the best photo of packing at home, I'm hopefully going to inspire you, wins a prize. We're going to give out a visionary t shirt. To the best person, best photo of someone packing at home, okay? So submissions before Friday, 8 p.m. Uh, post them into my group on Facebook or post them on Instagram. Tag me or hashtag safety hour. Although you could also do hashtag one jump one tree if you wanted to and we'll find it from there as well. Um, don't jump new kit. Make that decision soon. Don't downsize onto that new canopy you bought over the winter on your first jump back. Come on. Um, Make a decision not to jump in edgy conditions. Your personal limits have probably changed. If your last jump was September, you might well have been happy jumping in um, limits, uh, wind limits or cloud that's you know, a little bit challenging. But right now, you're probably uncurrent. You're probably not used to it. Be honest with yourself and remember the sky will be there tomorrow unless you jump and it all goes wrong. Okay? Don't be desperate to jump. Don't push the limits and make that decision beforehand. Um, Make a plan for your first jump back as well. Don't get carried away. Don't see all your mates and go like, yeah, let's do this 12 way. Let's do multiplane. Um, just keep it simple. If it's been six months, if it's been nine months, just go and do a solo. It doesn't matter. You can still practice your skills on a solo in free fall. Um, maybe a two way, three way tops. It's just err on the side of caution, but you know what sort of gap you are most used to, most used to. Um, will you open normal height or will you do a high pull and open at 5,000 feet, 6,000 feet? Um, it's up to you, but make that decision before you go. Personally, I'm going to be opening around about 5,000 feet, I think, and just doing some canopy drills. Um, and if you are opening high, don't forget to tell Manifest and the Jump Master. Chris. Oh, yeah. Um, I definitely back do a solo first. You don't need to go and jump with anyone else. Maximum two-way, I'd say, um, personally. Um, um yeah also when you um you don't have to jump if you go to a dz i find it pretty hard not to um but yeah like especially if you're less experienced um less experienced jump or you have had like a super long time off you didn't jump over the winter it might be worth just going to the drop zone and seeing how the procedures have changed you might get to the drop zone <coughs> and feel that you're not happy with the um like with the processes that they have in place so don't go to the drop zone and go i'm going there to jump go there and go and be prepared to walk away if you're not happy with any of the stuff that brian just said that you're not happy with the conditions or you're not happy with the um uh with the covid kind of the, the changes that are in in due to covid okay um you can learn a huge amount by watching people um not only people free falling but watching kind of how how systems have changed so I'd, I'd i'd highly recommend that for me it was really useful going to langer um seeing how they have operated and how they're doing things and then try and kind of see how we can implement some of those things at simpson once we start jumping um 
do as much as your kit and docs at home. Like we're trying to, like it's a really good thing to do anyway, to have um, electronic copies of all your kit and docs. So take a picture of it, save it on uh, your iCloud or save it somewhere else and then send it to the DZs. Definitely Langer are doing it and Simpson are looking to do it as well, okay? So do all that before you leave home. Um, look, um, if you're jumping at a different DZ, so I haven't personally, I've done quite a few jumps at Langer, but it's not my home DZ. So just have a look on like on Google Earth or Google Earth Pro and um, try and pick out some key features. So you can you can see where it, key features from all different like um, rays, of the, rays of the compass. So if the run-in is going north, where, what am I likely to see? If, I, if the run-in is going south, what's a key feature that I'm going to see there and same east and west, okay? So try and pick out some key features that you can use. Um, Brian's already mentioned it, the, uh, the masks. I certainly made the mistake of, like I tried it once, but like I didn't try it with my helmet. And then because I haven't had managed to get a haircut, I had stupid hair in my face when I was um, flying, like it wasn't too bad in free fall, but in canopy, it was just kind of, just just wasn't the same as it was. It's not an issue, but it's like, it was just different. Um, and then if that had been that on top of a malfunction, it would have just, it would have been another link in the chain, which I wouldn't have wanted. Okay, so it sounds stupid, but try it on. Um, and like Brian said, do it a couple of times. Um, also, I'm not a doctor. Um, I don't know. Um, oh, that's one other thing I was gonna mention. Um, respect people's personal decisions about what they think about COVID, okay? Um, if people don't want to high five or don't want to shake hands, we shouldn't be doing that anyway. But don't do it and don't, don't kind of take it personally. If people want to stay away, we should feel lucky that we're, um, that we're able to jump, to go and jump. So kind of let's, let's all try and respect that and stick to the rules the best we can, okay? I think. Um, what else what else what else um respect i was used no high-fiving um i would imagine that like we've already seen sort of local lockdowns in leicester if um if there's a lockdown if there's cases to, of covid linked to drop zones i would be very surprised if um it's not kibosh pretty quickly and all the drop zones are shut down okay so i think if we've all kind of got a bit of responsibility to um try and as kind of as hygiene i don't know what the right word is anti-covid is not anti-covid but as clean as possible make sure we wash our hands and stick to all the all the legislation and um all the guidance um once we've kind of done all the covid stuff so we've um you'll probably will have to do definitely at langer and sibson you're going to be doing um covid questionnaires so we'll do all of those but once we've done that we're back to kind of normal skydiving the problem with not the problem but it's something to consider in my like i've been thinking it's like it's another it's another um i don't know whether stress is the right word but it's it's using energy and kind of brain brain power to stop thinking about all of that rather than concentrating on the job at hand okay to try and put all of that out the side and then concentrate on on, on the job in hand um same thing when you turn up to any drop zone look at the wind socks um look at um winds aloft find out where re remind yourself where north is try and find out as soon as you can what the running is what is it a left-handed or a right-handed pattern um and make make a plan um for your start making a plan for your landing pattern all of those sorts of things it's it's the normal stuff um before we go and start manifesting make sure all your kits turn all your LEDs turns on make sure that none of the pins are being dislodged when you're moving the kit um, in and out of the car or if you had to brake heavily or anything like that so make sure everything's turned on well before um well before you start going to manifest so sort your stuff out and then go and start manifesting i think that's pretty much it from that point brian cool thank you so 20 minute call if you were usually late to the manifest point then sort yourself out it is even more important to be on time things are going to take longer it's not just you it's everyone on your lift one mistake can be handled, but when they start compounding with everyone making just one mistake, that's when it becomes a problem. Be early, be safe, being safe is cool. It'll take longer because you're not used to it, you're uncurrent, and uh, Chris, what was it like at Langer when you went for, to get checked? Yeah, so um, obviously now we're trying to reduce the um, like hand-to-hand -to -hand touch or, or person-to-person -to -person touching. 
So at Langer, it was running a B license program. Um, so it's kind of our responsibilities as sort of B license skydivers and above to ensure that we're checked. Um, I think we're pretty much doing the same as Sibson. Um, and um, so your responsibility for getting yourself checked and then the jump master um, at Langer, the jump master is the only person that will sign the manifest to sign that everyone's been checked. At Sibson, it'll be DZ control. So the person who's doing DZ control, he will sign for everyone that's being checked. So what does that mean? Potentially get someone else to check your kit when you're putting it on. Um, so just like do it visually. Like I'm not a big fan of like people doing kind of touchy checking. You don't need to check too much with your hands. You can check a lot with your eyes. Um, obviously, if something looks wrong, then you might need to go and kind of investigate with your fingers or in your hands rather than um, just looking with your eyes. Or just at that point, you're just going to ask people like, are you happy with how your bridle um, is rooted? If you're not happy with checking other people's kit, like I personally jump um, some path or javelin rigs, like I'm, I know how to pack a, a vector, but I'm not overly familiar with it. And I certainly haven't packed one for a long time. Okay. So if you're not familiar with that, make sure that if you're checking that piece of kit, make sure you know the piece of kit that you're checking. Um, hopefully we won't be well maybe we will be checking some wingsuits on the first load if you're not happy checking wingsuits or you don't know about um, like how to do it just ask ask someone else to, to do, do the checks um, again ensure that you know the run and ensure that you know the spot um, if you can again you use that time don't just kind of sit, like don't just sit back and go oh like I'm, I'm now, now because I'm not checking, I'm, I'm stopping doing everything else. Still keep an eye on other people, like visually check everyone's chest straps and look after each other and make sure if someone's a, um, altimeter is offset, just say to them, like, I think your altimeter is offset. Try and look after, look after everyone. If you can't see someone's got goggles around their neck, go, do you realize you've forgotten your goggles? Um, nothing changes from that point of view. Like look after everyone in the pen, try and have a glance over everyone. If someone's piped bridles out, we can still say like, uh, make your bridles out. Um, or your pilot shoots and like, doesn't look like it's tucked in. Okay. So in my mind, like maybe because we're not doing the checks, maybe we need to kind of all open our eyes a little bit more and, um, and help each other um, and take, take responsibility for everyone. I think. Cool. Cheers, Chris. Uh, find out who is jump master, make their life easy. Everything is going to be more difficult now, please. It might be me, please, please, please. Who else is on the plane? Find out who, who is on there. How many groups? How many people are in those groups? How many groups? You know, are there any groups? Is it 10 solos or is it 14 solos or is it seven solos? You know, depending on which drop zone you go to. Who's in charge of when you get out of the airplane? It's a trick question. You are. You should always look. Make sure you're in the right place. But have you checked the exit order? Have you agreed? Does it, do you agree with it? Pull heights. Is someone getting out low? Is somebody opening high? Is everybody opening high? If yes, what order are you going to have? Don't just rely on the jump master. Take personal responsibility. Pretend you are the jump master because the next lift, it might actually be you if you have a B license or above. Um, check the decisions you would have made against what the jump master made. It's a great way to feel confident about being jump master in the future. Uh, Chris is going to run through jump master duties later on in the plane um, and then walk into the plane. Walk. Never, it's never a good idea to run to a plane. It always means you're rushing, which means there's a potential for forgetting something. It also means you might trip over and fall flat on your face. Um, face masks are not going to help. Maintain your social distancing. Be distant. Be physically distant, but don't necessarily be socially distant. You know, we, we, we're all still friends. We're all still jumpers. Um, just because we have to stand a bit further apart doesn't mean we can't be friendly. You can still chat to people. Um, but like Chris says, doesn't mean we should stop looking after each other. You know, it's physical distancing not social distancing keep your eyes open look at people's kit if you're not happy with anything you say just like before say it. it's better to um say it and look silly on the ground than something bad afterwards chris in the plane buddy uh yeah i'll just go back to one point uh that you touched on there brian is that um the the just number the facts, of <laughs> the number of, i think it is kind of fact i think uh just number of the number of groups okay so if we um at langer they're down to 10 groups uh, 10 groups, 10, pe 10, so 10 people on the plane. Um, at Sibson, it might be a bit more. It will change from DZ to DZ. If we're doing 10 solos, then there's going to be, that's effectively like having 10 groups. It's very rare that kind of when we were kind of back in normal jumping, or it's quite rare that we're going to have that number of people. So with that, what does that mean? Start thinking if there are, if there are all, everyone's doing solos, then the last couple of people are likely to be a long way away. What does that mean? 
I'm not going to have the usual visuals. It's going to be harder for me to see where the DZ is because I'm further away. It's going to be harder for me to find those key landmarks to then orientate myself. So if you are those last groups, try and work out how far away like you're likely to be. If you're too far away and you're not happy that to get out, like Brian said, it's our responsibility to have a, um, to have a look. Um, make sure you're happy to get out. Um, we're all meant to stay within that one and a half nautical mile bubble. If the red light comes back on, the pilot might be telling us that we've gone too far. Um, so that's just one thing to be aware of if there are lots and lots of groups and if people are taking a little bit longer to get out. If someone's masks come down or like their mask gone up over their eyes, that might delay them in the door a little bit, which then might push us a little bit further if you're the last out a little bit deeper into that spot. Okay? So I think that's one thing that I sort of semi felt was happening at Langer the other day. It wasn't bad at all, but it's like you have something to be aware of. Cool, in the plane. Um, jump master duties. Um, when I was doing the um, B license briefs for the Sibson guys, I phoned up kind of Tim Porter and talked, I know this is the fact, this is leading to the facts, but I'm sorry. Um, this is, uh, so Tim, Tim Porter's done more jumps than, like he's, he's been jumping for longer than I've been alive, I think. Um, and he, I was asking him what, what is being a jump master? And he was like, well, I'm still learning now. Last year he was organizing an event Two like two guys came up and they were like, oh, we're flying dynamic wingsuit. And Tim Porter's like, oh, I'm, I don't know what, like where, like where to put them, okay? So if Tim Porter's still working out kind of how to be a jump master and effect, like um, how to organize certain loads and different groups and stuff like that, so are all of so are all of we we're all still learning how to be a jump master um but i think the the kind of the the way that i tried to think about it and tried to was trying to kind of get across to the people i was doing the b license for is try and be another pair of eyes and ears for the chief instructor okay um if we're doing that then i think if you always have that in the back of your mind then i think you're kind of doing a pretty good job as a jump master so you're trying to keep people safe you're trying to make sure that um getting out in the right order, make sure the center of gravity in the plane's the right order, um, making sure people have taken their restraints off. Now we're trying to make sure that people aren't taking their gloves off, keeping their um, face coverings on, so there's a, a lot more to think about. Um, if you're not the jump master, try and help him out. So like, we should all be trying to help uh, the chief instructor out to make his life easier, try and help as like as, as a sort of normal club jumper, we should be trying to help the jump master out to then make his job easier, so that then the chief instructor can kind of just go and do his thing. Um, that's kind of the jump master thing. I won't go into, I won't, just the facts, sorry. Um, our Langers, and I think at most drop zones, we're having to clean the plane, okay? So um, work out who's gonna do it. Um, it will usually be someone who's kind of familiar with the DZ and work out where they're cleaning it and how they're cleaning it. When we're doing that, everyone's trying to maintain social distancing. Um, and then obviously we've all got our gloves on. Um, I think the majority of the drop zones are limiting flight times to 15 minutes. They're see, that seems to be a kind of a fairly common theme, okay? And flight, that's from kind of when we're getting on the aircraft to the door being opening and we're exiting. So, with that in mind, we need to get on as quickly as as quickly and as efficiently as we can. That doesn't mean we're all kind of running in and kind of piling into the back of the plane and like screaming off down the runway. We're all kind of just doing it in a controlled manner, but make sure, again, help the jump master out, approach the plane in the order that we're meant to be getting on um, and try and do it with as least hassle as you can. Once we are, um, once we are on the plane, um, just give the pilot um, a thumbs up. Try it. We're trying not to shout or to speak. Just sit there, nice and relaxed. And again, mentally rehearse going through what you're going through. Um, a langer for sure, and at Sibson, keeping the door open for as long as possible. So in the taxiing, um, door will be up, circulate, getting as much air circulating as possible. Um, and then at certain altitudes, depending on the drop zone um, and probably how cold it is, um, they'll uh, they will they'll open the doors. Um, same as the summer. One thing on that, like. My personal view is that the door either is fully open or fully closed. It's not halfway in between. Um, again, I'm sure lots of people have opinions on that. Um, Chris, you're just uh, breaking up there, so I'm just going to stick everyone, it. Like, you. Can you hear me still? Yeah, you had a little break up. So, <laughs> door fully open or door fully shut? 
who yeah so in in my in my opinion it's door door is either fully closed or fully open it's not kind of half open the reasons for that is that if a pilot shoot goes out um you don't want the kind of the pilot show going out and then dragging the side of the plane out as well if the pilot shoot goes out you want the option of getting that person out as quickly as you can so that they don't damage or make the situation worse um cool um stay relaxed enjoy it it's free. it's great to be back on a plane climbing to altitude i promise um it's yeah it's really good um we should have done all this before you um before you get to the drop zone go through the emergency procedures so if the, at at um at what altitude will you um will you exit will you exit on what parachute um brian's just stuck something in saying group exercise i'll leave it to you brian to do the group exercise well that's where we had it before right but it's not there now i don't know where it's gone anyway um regulars uh you know what's coming up so people that take responsibility and think for themselves last the longest in this sport everyone needs to be able to identify issues calculate the risks understand them and mitigate them if they can Right now, I'm going to split you all into small groups, groups of three. You and two other people chosen at random by the software. You've got two minutes to say hi very, very quickly. And then I want you to discuss your decision heights. Okay, you are in the plane. There is an aircraft emergency. The pilot says, get out. Are you getting out on your main canopy or on your reserve canopy? Your decision height will uh, decide this. Above, you get out on your main canopy. Below, you get out on your reserve. There are no wrong answers. It's a personal decision. When you come back, stick your heights in the chat function. Maybe nominate someone who could type quickly to list all three heights in your group if you want. If your group came up with something interesting, we may have time for two, maybe three people to talk as well. So raise your hand if you are your team's nominated spokesperson and you will have 20 seconds to share your group's thoughts, but we do prefer a typed answer, please. Okay, quick summary. One, say hi. Two, discuss your personal decision height. Three, get ready to share them and go okay you should now see a link click the link and it'll take you into your chat room okay so we've got 19 seconds left on the chat And then it'll automatically close and we'll see everybody. Jordan Ho, good work. End in there quick, dude. Cool. Breakout rooms have finished. Everyone is back. Just to clarify, um, I've definitely ticked the selection now. That means that you can't unmute yourself. You're going to have to wait for Chris or I to unmute you. Um, naughty people unmuting yourselves. Okay, cool. Thank you for coming back. Everyone's back in the room. For anybody on the catch-up recording, we've just been in breakout rooms for the past two minutes. Um, we were discussing decision heights. So what's everyone got? Stick it in the chat. Who's going to have the highest? Who's going to have the lowest? Then remember, this is a personal decision, and the only wrong answer is not to have one. Did anyone yeah. want to talk? If you did, we'll have 20 seconds. Raise your virtual Zoom hand or raise your real hand, and we'll skim through the visuals here to see you. Chris, can you see any hands raised? Uh, so Marsh's group had 1,500 feet, 2,000, 25. Lizzie Atwood's group went for 25. Mikhail, 25. Stefan, 2,000. Elliot, 1,500. Uh, Jordan says 3,000 feet for him. Uh, Stu, Chris and Anna, 2,000 feet. Main above, reserve below. Jamie Ball, 1,500 feet. Uh, Neil, Neil Patrick, hit me. Talk to me. Okay, so I've got two because... TI in accordance with the rules, follow the tandem under four under four reserve above main personal fifteen hundred feet and above main below reserve. Uh, the other two guys in the group are lower, more lower experienced. One guy said three thousand feet and under would be reserve, and the other guy said three thousand five hundred as well. Thank you. Um, one to think about I th personally is if we if we haven't climbed through 1500 feet just to be aware that you're if you're using a cypress at least for AADs I'm not sure about vigil but your cypress hasn't armed okay so it's on but it hasn't armed so if we get out when we're below 1500 feet your AAD will not fire 
So it's something something else to be aware of. Yeah. Um, just on that, uh, one of the group, Mike Ball, says he's going to stay on until they pass through 1,500 feet. That might not be an option. So just be aware the whole time uh, what's going on. Um, I think personally, my decision height would be 1,500 feet. Um, I guess it depends how rapidly the plane is descending um, as to whether I think I'll be on 1,500 feet or above or below when I get out the door. Chris, what would, you, what would yours be? Um, I'm going to probably stay, I'm not probably going to get out of the plane until 1500 feet. Um, from 1500 feet to probably, if it's an aircraft emergency, I'll probably get out on the May on my reserve until about two and a half, maybe three. Um, and then above that, I'll be main. Depends what canopy as well. Like it, it, there are a lot of variables um, and what's happening with the plane. Yeah, and there's no wrong answers to this. It is personal decision. It's entirely up to you what you feel comfortable with. A repack is what, 40, 45, 50 pounds? Um, it's worth it sometimes. Okay, cool. Let's. I think we're done one with that. Thing, one thing that um, just the Tim, fact, man. Sorry, man. <laughs> Tim Porth did mention that sort of don't if if you see someone getting out on their main, don't that doesn't mean necessarily you're going to get out on your main. Okay, so as a jump master, the jump master may have to leave, and he may be getting out on his main, but he knows it, or we can all know that the um, the that the plane's going down. So. If the plane is descending, the first few people might be able to get out on their main, then the next few people are going to have to get out on their reserves. Just something else to, to throw in there. Yeah, and Papaji and Hannah have just reminded me of one of the important points as well. Um, you wouldn't take that number too low of what you're getting out on because it depends what height your AAD would fire at. So if you've got a student AAD and you're, it's going to fire around about 1,500 feet, then you definitely want to be doing it 2,000, maybe even 2,500 if you're on a student AAD. Um, have a think about that because what you don't want to do is get out deploy the main and you're still accelerating um, as you go through AAD fire height. And well, hey, you just survived an aircraft emergency and now you have two parachutes out winning. Um, okay. I, I personally, I personally am a big advocate of raising the firing height of your uh, AAD, but that's another conversation. I don't understand why you do it at a thousand feet. Um, take it up, take, take your firing height up. It's, why wouldn't you? Being at 750 feet with no canopy above your head is no place I want to be, <laughs> for sure. Um, cool. So back into um, in the plane, like visualize, like really concentrate on um, on what you're going to do. Like have a. It goes back to kind of basic FS stuff or or any jump. Have a plan and then jump the plan. Okay, um, and you can use that time to visualize the jump. Don't just visualize um, the free fall. Visualize how it's going to be when you go in for the pool, how your body is going to react, what the deployment is going to feel like. Try and remember what it feels like when you throw your pilot chute, how you can feel your main bag coming off your back, when you feel the risers coming up, when you go from a belly position into a vertical position, when your feet come down. Feel how your can remember how your canopy opens, how you move around. Um, and then how like what it feels like when you kind of get her get level and like, fully under a fully inflated canopy remember that and uh, and um and try and spend that time visualizing do it before you get to the drop zone as well um enjoy it like enjoy being able to go back up in the air it's it is good um what are you going to do with your face mask are you going to leave them on or are you going to take them off and um, there's been a couple of videos flying around of um a face mask coming up and covering covering people's eyes um be aware of what what you're uh, what you're going to do um cfg like um uh, grant from sibson and um a few of the other pilots did a great talk on cfg i didn't record it sorry brian um about how important the cfg is okay um do do be aware of it and see how if there are less people on the aircraft, how that may affect the CFG. If there's one big group exiting, so like the last jump I did at Langer, it was a six or six or seven way, um, and then there are only two people left on the plane. So that then affects the CFG potentially more than if there was a plane full of people and there were four, like a five or people, five or six people going out. So really concentrate on where that red line is, or if there isn't a red line in the plane, speak to the jump master, find out where the CFG should be. Okay. Chris, um, just quickly, just for people who may not be aware, CFG stands for centre of gravity, and if the plane, so the plane is flying along, and if the CFG goes wrong, then the plane is going to tip up um, the back end is heavier and eventually it'll start falling out of the sky because it doesn't have enough forward speed it is 
really important to uh, pay attention to it. And <clears throat> thank you for the question. And, and also, it's really important to pay attention to it, but it's also really, really easy not to fuck it up. Um, make sure you know how many people should be behind the line and in front of the line. It varies from aircraft to aircraft and drop zone to drop zone. So I can't, I can't say specifically now. Um, in free fall, enjoy it. Like, it's really good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> concentrate. Um, it is try, really good. It, 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 is, it, is. it is really good. It I is good. Remember. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it is, it's better than you remember. Um, and then execute the plan, okay? So I've already said it. Like, have a plan um, and execute the plan. It doesn't mean I can't say what jump you should go and do. Um, do something that's completely within your, within your comfort, comfort zone. Um, and... And re like use use each jump. Okay, I'm not a, like a huge fan of going out and just wasting a jump. Doing a solo, go out and do a solo, but really concentrate on that solo. If you're practicing knee turns or practicing side sliding or practicing tracking or practicing flying on your head or whatever you're doing, really try and concentrate on specific bits. If you've just if you've just got like 25 jumps, you adjust off your AFF, just AFF. Like really concentrate on practice pull. Do four or five practice pulls, but really concentrate on staying level on. Uh, staying level on the horizon, really concentrate on nice smooth body position, concentrate on your legs not moving. There's loads you can concentrate and use each jump as much as you can. Okay, try and get something from each jump. Um, da -da -da, what else have I missed? Um, keep it simple. Well, that's kind of like the main thing. Um, again, maintain exit separations. Um, I'll try and post a link on the email that Brian's going to send out about how to calculate exit separations. Um, G, one of the chief pilots at Chatteris, um, he's done a kind of really nice um, exit separation chart, which is really easy to work out the number of seconds that should be between each group. It's exit separation, not setup separation. So we don't, it's, that hasn't changed, okay? So it doesn't mean getting in the door 10 seconds after the last persons have left, or the last group has left. It's exiting after the last, 10 seconds after that last group have left. Also some things to think about, hopefully we won't, we won't be climbing outside too much and kind of making complicated jumps, but once we build up currency again, it's thinking about um, what happens if you are climbing out quite soon after that last group to exit and you fall off. What's your plan there? Like how do you, where do you move to in the sky in relationship to that last group that's just left? Do you try and track off um like 45 degrees if you're that group with the guy that's just for, guy or girl that's just falling off what do you then do so all these sorts of things are, are like really important to consider and to discuss if you if you're one of your group has fallen off and you're still in the plane potentially wait a little bit longer and then someone in that group can tell the group after you that guys we're going to have to wait a little bit longer you're likely to be deep so then they're going to need to be aware that, okay, if I'm really deep on a deep spot, then I might need to pull higher to give me more altitude to get back again. So that one person falling off has then affected everyone that's still in the plane and potentially the group that has, um, that has left already. Okay. So um, that's something to consider with the exit, some, the, not the exit separation, but like the exit scenario. Um, what else? I think that's pretty much it for my part of free fall, Brian. Cool. Um, so pool heights. You've got A and B licenses are allowed to open, have to be open for 3,000 feet. C and D licenses have to be open for 2,500 feet. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, think about, are you going to pull high on this jump? Are you going to pull high forever and ever? Are you going to pull the same height as the other people on your skydive? Um, as you're about to pull, don't forget to flare out of any movement or track before deploying. Gentle openings are good. Gentle and on heading openings are best. Chris, under canopy, buddy. Yeah, um, Mikhail, Mikhail um, just put, um, yeah, if you are a student or an unlicensed skydiver, then for sure, like in an aircraft emergency, um, definitely listening to the, um, listening to the jump master. I'll just go back a little bit before I go to canopy. Um, if there is an aircraft emergency, the pilot is going to be doing his doing three things, okay? Or his priorities are to aviate, so to fly the damn thing, which is 
potentially trying to fall out of the sky. He's then going to be navigating and then he's going to communicate. Okay, So communicating with us, us, the guys in the back, is his last priority. He's got to fly the damn thing. He's got to navigate it. Then he's going to talk to us. So in that situation, try and make everything as easy as you can for that communication to happen. Don't go leaning into the center of the plane. Try and make that line of communication between the jump master or like the experienced jumpers on the plane to the pilot as easy as we can. Don't everyone go leaning into the middle, kind of shouting and try and stay as calm as we can. Make sure we're personally really good to get out of the airplane. So make sure you're, um, you're doing your hands on checks, making sure you, like making sure your restraints off oh, it's a really simple one like i've definitely left my restraint on until like pretty much exit point before and like tried to stand up and still notice my restraint on. i should think most people like if you haven't done it you probably will do it um <laughs> sorry just the fact um so yeah aircraft emergencies communicate with the uh let the jump master communicate with the pilot um under canopy um Breathe, relax, enjoy it. Um, you've got something above your head which has hopefully saved your life. Um, be conservative. Um, if you are doing a, any specific turns, like 270, I'm not a CP coach at all, but like I'm trying to learn, I'm, I am learning how to like, fly my canopy better. Um, be conservative, like go back like to what you were doing two, 300 jumps ago, take the heights up, um, if you're like land under a flat and level canopy um, and be super conservative. Um, Chris, Chris Cook's um, article on um, getting back into swooping is a really good one and Brian will post that link um, in the email as well. Yeah, so relax, breathe, enjoy, or maybe not. Maybe you're having a malfunction. What do you need to know? Is it big? Is it square? Is it all there? Yes, yes, yes. Or is there a no in there? If there's any doubt, there's no doubt. Could you pull the handle? Um, if you couldn't pull the handle, no more than two attempts, then you're into your emergency procedures. Have you practiced your emergency procedures yet? You should be thinking about that. Um, but it, regarding malfunction, simple is best. You don't need to know the names of anything. You don't need to know the specifics. Just is it big? Is it square? Is it all there? Yes, yes, yes. Three yeses is good. If there's one no, you've got a problem. If there's any doubt, there's no doubt. With that in mind, I'm just going to run through a couple of other scenarios. I see we've got a few Q&A coming in. We'll get to those in a little bit, unless they are valid for where we're at now. So I'm a little bit uncurrent. This, I haven't done an AFF ground school since September. That's no, nine months now. So um, I'm not prepared to make mistakes. I've got a few notes here on other emergencies. So entanglements, and this is straight from the Langer AFF ground school. There are probably variations at many other um, drop zones, uh, but it shouldn't be minor. You know, these, these have been fine tuned over the years. So an entanglement, uh, basically entanglement is when you have deployed and you are caught in your canopy or you, or, or one of the lines or some fabric is around you, something like that. You should make, you should prevent this by having a really stable body position and looking at the horizon when you deploy and having a good throw so the pilot should goes way out to the side into the clean air. Um, <clears throat> if you are entangled, um, check your main parachute. You're looking for a large rectangular shape. It might be turning because of your entanglement. But the next thing you need to do is you need to check your altimeter. meter. You need to know how high you are. If you're over 2,000 feet, you need to keep, you need to try and get yourself out. It's a serious situation. Try and get out there. Then you might be your arm caught out. You can pull it out, whatever. Um, if you are at or below 2,000 feet and you're still entangled with the lines of your parachute, this is a dangerous and life-threatening situation. Deploy your reserve without cutting away your main. Um, more parachute above you will hopefully improve your situation um, now you've got the reserve out make a further attempt to disentangle yourself it should some of the tension should have been released it should be a little bit easier reassess the situation do you have at least one controllable landable canopy um, as a last resort if you now firmly believe that cutting away will improve matters you may choose to do so but only if you firmly believe that cutting away is going to be a priority Two canopies, both canopies out. Um, maybe you did get out on that aircraft emergency too low on your main and your, your reserve fired. If they're stable, if they are side by side or they're in front of each other, in effect, you've got one big parachute. If this is the case, we can safely fly it to, to the ground. Um, steer the toggles of the main canopy. It should be the dominant canopy. Um, mostly in the UK, 
main toggles are yellow and reserve toggles are red, but it may not be at your drop zone. Worth checking that. If you're on higher kits, you should know that on your own kit as well. If not, ask your rigger. Um, make small inputs, the minimum required to navigate back to the landing area, and you don't need to flare. You've got two parachutes above your head, you'll be coming down super slow. Keep the toggles up, no radical movements. Okay. If the two canopies are starting to fly apart from each other, you're in a down plane. Um, it's not cool. You've got a high rate of descent. You must act immediately, cutting away your main canopy and your swing under your reserve canopy. A horseshoe is a little, people get this confused with entanglement. So the slight difference is the horseshoe is when your pin has um, come loose and the canopy has started coming out of the container on the back and you feel something bouncing around, but you know you haven't pulled your pilot chute yet. So it's not a malfunction because you haven't deployed. So the issue is you've got to then put it back into sequence. It's out of sequence, you've got to put it back into sequence, deploy the pilot chute, and then you're probably going to look up and assess what's going on now. It, you may well be having a malfunction. You probably are. It's more, than, more likely than normal. Um, and then you'll deal with that from then on. Is it big? Is it square? Is it all there? But you need to put it back into sequence first if you have not deployed that pilot shoot. And the last one, cover this in depth on a different class. So I really recommend going to see, um, going to see and watch, listen to Simon Soper, his class um, from a month or so ago. It's still available. Um, a canopy collision. Uh, so this is different from entanglement in that you're caught up in someone else's canopy. Um, you should make every effort to avoid them. Um, definitely, definitely avoid them. Um, and learn some crew as well, it'll help. Um, it's a very serious situation. If you have a collision, check your canopy, okay? If you have a good canopy, keep it. If your canopy is not good, check your altitude. If you're above 1,000 feet, you could potentially cut away. Um, if you're below a thousand feet, cutting away is unlikely to be a survivable option. Just pull your reserve handle. Like we said, more fabric should, in effect, slow you down. It's a really serious situation. Just avoid it. Know where everyone is on the plane, um, and they'll try and see where everybody is in free fall, and keep an eye out as well. This is why people, um, some drop zones, stop radical turns. Um, basically, for this sort of scenario, 1,000 feet, for, for canopy collisions, 1,000 feet is the minimum cutaway height. If you're below 1,000 feet, um, it's a significant risk of death and it's just, it's not worth it. Um, if you're below 1,000 feet and you are in this canopy collision, deploy your reserve. Cool. Um, I feel a bit awkward at this point because we're both AFF instructors and we are taught never to discuss malfunctions and nuisance factors consecutively or at the same time because we there was a period in the british skydiving history where there were more there were some unnecessary cutaways basically from people cutting away from nuisance factors that said you guys are all qualified skydivers this is not on me um just on twists um if you have got twists not if, me it's what it's not on me either Good. Um, you put this in here. Um, so uh, don't be the story about the person that fought line twists for too long. If you're on a student canopy and it's a massive canopy, there's 240, 280, twists are not a problem. You can kick those out. They're absolutely fine. The canopy is probably going to swing you out anyway. But if you're on a radical canopy, um, it's a malfunction if you have uneven twists. Even twists are fine. Uneven twists are not. They're going to be spinning you around. There are a malfunction at some point. Do not spend too long working it out, even though it's just twists. Okay. At some point, 45 pounds is going to sound like a bargain for a good canopy. Um, you should have, with that, you should have a hard deck that you're fighting a bad canopy um, so that you won't go below that. Um, and it's, um, you need to have a little think about that. Um, if you have a MARD, and what I mean by that is a main activated reserve deployment, it's like a sky hook, uh, then it may be a little lower than if you have a traditional RSL on the equipment front, but it's your personal decision. If you don't know what you're doing, uh, on the caution and go higher okay during aff we teach 2000 feet and that's not a bad place to start okay chris canopy control you're on mute mate yeah sorry um yeah so uh we've got a good canopy above our head um three a's is always a really good place to start so altitude airspace and area or the flight one guys use tra tap so traffic altitude position and then systems okay make sure you are in your own clear airspace like have a good look around you can start doing it when you're de when the, through the deployment sequence so have like try and be aware of what's happening once you're going from 
belly to a, to a hot to a kind of to a vertical position. Once you've done that, then you're going to start looking to fly ideally off jump run okay especially if you're some of the first groups out and you're downwind of the target flying back towards the holding area make sure you don't fly up jump run until you can see that until you can see that next group opening so fly off jump run you can see the next guys opening and then you can start heading back up jump run okay um we don't want to be flying underneath like a group of a group that's opening um also again work on what we should have natural um horizontal and vertical separation okay if we don't have that try and work work your canopy to get that so if that means some of the guys at the front flying their canopy like on full drive doing some like um potentially doing some s turns to lose out lose a bit more altitude and some of the guys at the back or on bigger canopies flying flying their pattern on half breaks just to try and sit the canopy try and sit the canopy up and slow the descent rate try and learn how to fly your canopy um in in uh, in the in its range not necessarily doing that on your first jump hopefully we've got that um we won't have a lot of people on the aircraft and there won't be sort of big groups and doing big separation um but it's definitely something to start thinking about like especially if you're going on brian's big way like there'll be a lot of people in the air who aren't that current um potentially quite close together okay so make sure you're working away from each other gain that vertical separation as well as the horizontal separation under canopy just stick in the uh, stick in the chat what do you think is more important for landing vertical separation or horizontal separate um vertical or horizontal separation it'd be interesting to see what people's thoughts are um <clears throat> housekeeping so remember like Try and visualize what you do. So once you've, you've thrown your pilot sheet, you've got a good canopy above your head, what do you do? Do you collapse your slider and then pull it down or do you pull it down and then collapse it? When do you undo your chest strap? Do you have an RDS? Do you take your RDS off? How does it feel with cameras on your head? Maybe the first jump back, we don't use cameras. Like, why do you need to film? Like, yeah, it's nice to film the first jump back, but then potentially that's getting snagged up in your, um, in your slider when you're pulling it back down behind your... Um, behind you into your sky tie. Go through all this. If you're jumping camera, don't know why you'd be jumping camera rings on your first jump back, um, but how does it feel like? Even, even if it's not your first jump back and you're, we're not gonna be as current before we start jumping camera again, um, then we might be. So just like mentally go through in your head, but the process that you will go through or are likely to go through once, you've, once you're sorting your housekeeping out. Um, Nuisance factors, Brian's already, Brian's already talked about that, sort them out. Um, but like I said at the beginning, don't spend time sorting out something that is a malfunction. Brian, over to you, mate. Did you want to talk about premature toggle release? We haven't covered that. Oh, yeah, good point. Um, if, um, if you opened your canopy and the canopy's turning, um, it might just be a simple case of one of the toggles has come off. So effectively, you'll be flying around like this, okay? So um, when we pack, we pack on half brakes. If one of the toggles has come off, it's effectively like this left one, my, my left one, so it probably looks like my right to you guys, but um, that will then induce a turn to my right, okay? So again, sorting that out, hands into the toggles, and then a proper flare. Um, when that, that does happen, like one of the guys from... Uh, Sibson mentioned that. Be aware that that toggle that has come out during the deployment sequence might then have got wrapped around the lines or wrapped around the risers. So when you try and then clear it and try and go to um, do your practice flare, it then might have had a toggle lock. So although we think we've sorted out the um, premature brake fire, that can quite often lead into um, like a toggle lock situation or like a potential knock. So again, that's that's kind of what we're saying. What Brian was saying is like don't spend time sorting out nuisance factors um that potentially could lead into a malfunction today cheers brian cool landing patterns you should have one as soon as you get to the drop zone you look at the windsock okay i'm gonna and then just nominate a spot doesn't matter where maybe somewhere nowhere near anybody else it's always good to walk back from a, a bit further away than try and land too close and fuck it up uh landing pattern okay i'm gonna land here so i'm just gonna use um 300 600 a thousand feet it's pretty common uh, so if i want to land here I'm going to need to be here at 300 feet. That means I need to be here at 600 feet. I'm going to be there at 1,000 feet. 
use that with your memory of the drop zone, but also go look at the um, photo, aerial photographs or the maps that they've got on display and make a pattern. And then you look down between your feet, a thousand feet, am I where I wanted to be? Am I 600 feet where I wanted to be? And you use that knowledge to adjust the next time to make it better. Um, but if you're at a thousand feet and you're, and you're nowhere near your point, or you realize you're not gonna get there at a thousand feet, uh, then you head straight for the 600 feet um, turn. Make sure if it's um, your drop, you know if your drop zone is left hand, right hand, or both. Um, your canopy is open. What canopy drills are you going to do? You're open, probably open a little bit higher. Um, well, first off, CH1, CH2, shit, I should know. Um, reserve riser turns to avoid emergency maneuvers. Um, so do a 90 left, 90 right, rear risers. Um, then maybe um, pop your toggles if you want. Um, but also do 90. 90 degree turns, both directions, with your toggles, with the rear risers, with the front risers, if you're into that sort of thing. Practice your flare. Come on, everyone will. How much input, um, so look up to the canopy. How much input to remove the slack from your control lines? Pull the toggles down, work it out. Okay, um, where's your stall point? Make sure you're in the right place. I prefer tap, um, traffic, altitude, position. I just get the three A's confused. So traffic, altitude, position, um, and then hold the, pull your toggles down, Slowly, slowly, inch them down, looking up at the canopy the whole time um, until you feel the canopy start to buckle and it'll come in and kiss itself. Um, and let the toggles up slowly and evenly. Okay, so you know you now know your range of your useful input, where it starts and where it, your useful input ends, and that's your flare stroke, just above the stall point anyway. Um, so try that out. And the next exercise, from full flight, traffic altitude position, um, how much input do you need to swing forward to be level with the front of your canopy? Um, you know, and that's probably the sweet spot for the initial part of your flare. But practice will give you that as well. And um, if you're doing stuff like that, also practice emergency recovery. So you're doing a turn, maybe a rear riser turn or something like that, uh, and then a drastic sudden recovery flare. So sharp down to see what it's like, just to know that if you did turn low, you've got practice of recovering from that. Chris, off landings, buddy. Oh yeah, so off landings, when are they most likely to happen? Um, if, they're, if we had an aircraft emergency, we're unlikely to be over the drop zone. The pilot will often try and fly us back to over the drop zone, so that's kind of a doubly bad situation. We've had an aircraft emergency, we've got out somewhere um, where we're not likely to know anything. Um, what else might also be going on if there's an aircraft emergency? Like if it's a bad, like if it's a, like a, Full on aircraft emergency, you're likely to have 10, 15 people pretty much piling out on top of each other. So there's an increased chance that we're going to be super close um, under canopy when we open, okay? So that's another thing to consider. Um, and like Brian was just mentioned about learning to fly on your rear risers, learning to fly the opening kind of in the harness and all those sorts of things. Back to off landings. Um, any of the off landings is basically try and make a decision as early as you can, okay? So try and try and plan your jump, um, try and know where the major hazards are um, on, on your, or where jump run is, um, and try and make sure that you clear those as early as you can. If we do have to make a decision to, um, to land off, make that decision early don't be doing kind of like i think i can make it back actually mm, maybe i can't i think i can make it back no i can't uh, uh, i don't know and then and then you get to kind of 500 feet and go oh, balls this up i'm gonna have to then do a low turn and um, to get around okay it's better to go and land in a field two kilometers away under a flat and level canopy and then have to walk two kilometers back then doing a low hook turn um, and then ending up breaking yourself, okay? Go and land in a big, if you have to land off, pick a big open field, make the decision early, and go and land in it. Like there is like, yes, you have to fill in some paperwork, but it's, well, you might have to fill in some paperwork, but it's um, a hell of a lot better than, um, than breaking yourself. Um, if you do land off, if you're landing in a more complex situation, a, a nice tight PLF position. It doesn't matter if you're flying um, a sub 100 square foot canopy or if you're just doing like still on a 280. PLFs are super, super effective. Like two, like one leg on its own is no way near as strong as two legs. Make sure you both legs super tight together, nice tight body position and a really nice symmetrical flare, okay? Get underneath the canopy, both feet, and then you'll go and land, okay? Um, with any of the hazardous landings, like if it's trees, 
pylons, um, a building, anything like that. Just look, look away, steer away. There's like a classic video. I think it was the RF. I don't know who it was. I won't Just mention who it was. Man. I think. Yeah, about look, like where you're looking is where you go. If you're driving a car and you turn, look over that way, you'll turn that way. Okay? So again, where you look is where you go. Don't look at hazards, um, avoid them. Um, and also you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to uh, miss a hazard by a huge amount. If this is, this is my hazard here, like I don't have to do an aggressive turn to miss it. All I have to do is a small turn and that's missing it. Okay? Um, so, Again, landing under a flat and level canopy is the important bit. Um, cool, landing. So we we've had a um, we've we've managed to set up a decent landing pan. We've come to land on the um, come in landing back on the PLA. Keep it super simple. Like if you usually turn in at um, say three hundred feet, maybe turn at three hundred and fifty feet. But with that, then you're going to have to push your setup point back back a little bit further, okay? Because obviously we've got more, more altitude, we're then gonna glide a little bit further. Um, be aware of other traffic. Like, it was amazing at Langer the other day, there was still quite a lot of people quite close together under when we're coming in on final. Try and avoid that, try and generate that separation from the point when you're opening. Don't kind of get to final and then go, Oh, I wish I had more space. Like, try and generate that space from the moment you're opening um, and when you're kind of in your holding area. Um, smooth, symmetrical flare. Wait for the ground. Don't start reaching for the ground. Arms down by your side in a nice, smooth, symmetrical flare. Um, once we have landed, turn around and face the canopies um, that are coming towards you. Especially if you're kind of like one of the first ones down, you're going to have 10, 15 people who are all super uncurrent flying towards you at kind of 20, 30 miles an hour. Try not to get hit by them, okay? Turn around, face your canopy, do your housekeeping, stick your brakes away, do that all facing the canopies. Even if you're down like this, you can see things that are coming towards you out of your peripheral vision. If your back's towards them, then you're much more likely we, you'll have far fewer options of getting out of the way if you're getting hit, if you get hit. Um, move away from the center of the landing area. It's not too bad at, um, in most of the landing areas in the UK, but if once we start going to jump abroad, um, Algarve's really bad for it on the experience side. It's quite a narrow landing area, and people kind of land all across it, and then they'll just stay there. Once you've, um, once you've landed, watching the canopies move out of the way of the middle of the land area go and stand to the side of it um it's kind of just like it's it makes more space for everyone else it decreases the chance of you getting hit don't kite your canopy once you've um once you landed get your canopy on the ground get your canopy under control as quick as you can okay it, a canopy inflated takes up a huge amount of space there's been a number of occasions where people have been kind of kiting their canopy people are still trying to come in to land and then they like they're hitting the end of the canopy and people are getting wrapped up in each other's canopies and then increase the chance of damaging themselves. Um, avoiding the high fives, like giving each other a hug and all that sort of stuff, stay away from all of that. Um, try and maintain the social distancing. Um, and then be aware of um, how you're getting back to the drop zone. If you're at the Algarve or Headcorn or Simpson, we're gonna be getting back on the, um, back on a minibus to then get back. How are they doing that? Are you happy with getting on a minibus with 15 other people? Um, you've just got on a plane with them. Are there going to be tandems on them? Are there going to be other people? Who else is going to be driving the minibus? Those sorts of things you will need to consider. Um, and then same as always, make sure you check in with DZ Control. Brian. Sweet. Um, so you've landed, you're back at DZ Control, pack in, try and find your own space, preferably outside if you don't want to wear a mask. If you're inside, you probably you need to be considerate of other people. Um, likewise, if the packing area is cramped, um, don't put your helmet here, your gloves over there, your rig down here, and you know, just put it all in one place. Um, you know where it is and no one else will um, feel obliged to need to move it for you. Um, and no high-fiving and all that jazz. Chris, last line for you, buddy. You're on mute. Yeah, um, once you landed, go and pack and go get manifested again and go and get back up in the air. Perfect. I can't believe you wanted that line and then you fluffed it. <laughs> so embarrassing. Uh, okay, so we're into the Q&A, guys. So um, if you can all put your clothes back on, we're going to do some quick group photos now. Um, got about 30 seconds to do a quick photo. We've got a couple of questions and answers coming in too. So I think um, 
David said, should he do a hop and pop or should he do a high pull? Um, I, it depends on how many jumps you've got. Um, if you're happy looking, reminding yourself about the free fall and the canopy at the same time, then go for that. If you would just rather have a simpler picture and just focus on one discipline at the time, then do the hop and pop, get out at five, get out at six, whatever it is, and just focus on the canopy work. But if you've got enough jumps and you think you have the um, bandwidth to cope with both, then go for a simple free fall jump. I'm going to be probably, my plan is to do a sync solo or a two way free fall and then deploying at 5,000 feet. David, how many jumps, how many jumps have you got, mate? 79. Okay, yeah, I'd like go and do it. Well, it's, it's up to you, like, when was the last time you jumped? And um, for sure, I'm more than happy to talk about it um, later on. But like Brian said, just um, up to you. W work on specific stuff, though. Don't just go out and just burn a hole in the sky. Yeah. Cool. So I'm just going to do the photos now, guys. If everyone could give me a nice, cheeky thumbs up. Okay, going to count down. Three, two, one. Legends. Okay, second page coming up. Um, Hey, there's some faces I haven't seen. Hey, Jose. Um, okay, three, two, one. Awesome. Okay, um, what's the other Q and A we've got? Um, David Knox asked about super fast running speed. Um, I think that was if I don't know if that was about running speed or if that was during an aircraft emergency that popped up when we were talking about. Where's David that Knox? Bit. Not sure. David, can you clarify a bit? Um, Andy Dinage, you asked us to explain a bit more about recovery from a low turn. Yeah, I mean, if you if you realise you are low, then you flare. Um, you've got a flare. You should be you should be fully flared before you touch the ground. And if you if you think you're in a situation where you're not going to be fully flared um, because you've turned low, then get and you because you've got one toggle down, get the other toggle down. Um, the canopy should even itself out as best it can. It's your best option at that point. Stephen uh, Purcell. You'll be surprised how hard it is to do like an emergency um, emergency flare though. Like if you are, have put yourself in the corner, like to be able to pull down like aggressively, like like Brian said, practice it. But you'll be surprised how much energy and like how much strength you'll need, especially if you're really diving the canopies. Yeah. Um, so Stefan Purcell's got a couple of questions. What is good plane communication protocol now? Um, as little okay. as possible, but no shouting, hand signals. Chris, what did you do when you jumped? Uh, there shouldn't be that much. It's basically just kind of eye contact. You can tell a lot by eye contact. If you need, like, if you need to speak, you need to speak. And like, if if there is an aircraft emergency or something like that, in my mind, I'm going to be speaking to people. And if I'm jump master, I will be speaking to people. Like, and we'll deal about, we'll deal with the COVID situation after that. Um, but we have to survive to be able to to sort that out. Okay. Um, and I think it's there's a little bit of common sense. Um, obviously, try not to speak directly at people if you can if someone's over there you can speak this way they'll still be able to hear you but you're trying not to kind of speak directly at them with with your mouth you should have face coverings as well so that will should also help it's kind of the way i'm taking it but um i think it's quite a personal thing cool stefan Purcell. second question thoughts or discussions on issues with face masks inside helmet and scenarios this presents my plan is to use a buff double layered i'm going to send out a vid link video uh, of how to put it on that's been working. I've, I've seen them doing it in Eloy and other drop zones and especially in the UK as well. It makes it kind of bomb proof, so it's not coming off from that. Um, I think I'll probably leave it up for free fall, but when I'm under canopy, I'm probably going to drag it down just to get a little bit of um, a bit fresh air in there. That's the visor comes up as well. I left mine up the whole time and it was absolutely fine um, in that same, the same method that you're going to send out, Brian. Cool. Um, got another five minutes for Q and A. Um, pandemic jumping holes later webinar session. Yeah, perhaps Lizzie. Um, Harry, aircraft emergencies. I need a haircut. Yeah, yeah, we do. Harry I've got says, a I think I'm going to go for it. I think I'm going to grow it. Um, I think Harry, when you talk about aircraft emergencies, avoiding others when opening or just after deployment, something to think about. It just won't be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Think about it. You're all getting out on top of each other, and you're all opening up. Hopefully there'll be enough separation, but yeah, you should be on your rear risers ready to turn away straight away and you should be looking around. Try and keep your shoulders straight so your opening is on heading. Um, so your weight and your, and your harness is um, uh, balanced. But yeah, you're looking around for everything just to see who's around. Um, uh, has anybody experienced from Hannah and Papa G? Has anyone experienced higher than usual visor fogging or full face helmets as a result of wearing a face covering? I am very interested to see this actually. Didn't, um, I personally didn't experience it. 
Um, definitely not in free fall. Under canopy, I usually leave my visor fully down. Um, on one of the jumps, we went through a few few clouds, um, and it like I had to pop it up. It cleared, and then I popped the visor back down. Um, but there was no significant difference, mate. Cool. Jordan Ho wants to know what the COVID rules for higher kit are going to be. That's going to be drop zone specific, dude. I would get in touch with um, the drop zone you're going to. They're all going to be slightly different. Mikhail Baskov, hanging harness malfunction drills, gloves, face marks on both the instructors and tested. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, if you want to go get yourself in a suspended harness to practice your uh, reserve drills, absolutely. It's a great way, great thing to do. Um, and especially get an AFF instructor who's feeling a bit mischievous and they will throw some really complicated stuff at you. Uh, and yeah, both fa face marks on both the instructor and yourself. Um, Kate, you mentioned that we had different uh, heights, um, aircraft emergencies, um, and the reasons for it. What was your height again, Brian? You wouldn't get out? Um, on a reserve or on a main? Um, either. What was the question? Sorry, the question was... Um, Kate. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, both very experienced. Brian was, um, Brian's a very different main reserve height for an aircraft emergency. Um, um, in interested to know the reason for that. Um, I, I personally chose those heights because um, I've upped my AED firing height. Um, my main takes um, around 800 feet to open. Um, so, um, what does your AED open that now? Some of the reasons. What, what does your AED? Uh, thousand feet. Thousand feet. Yeah, I probably should do that. I'm not sure why. I, uh, I don't know. I don't know why you wouldn't like. Who, who? Stick your hand up if you've been to a thousand feet in freefall. Like, unless you're base jumping. What's the lowest anyone's been in free fall? Type it in the message. But yeah, you, Katie, yeah. <laughs> like, so what's the lowest anyone's been? Stick that in. If anyone's been, like, has anyone had an AAD fire? One person has, I know. But you don't have to. 1,800 feet, yeah, that's pretty low. <laughs> Two nine with Brian, nice. What? Chris, on an aircraft, so... Hopefully, Chris, that was in a, uh, a demo. <clears throat> yeah, so like even even to the lowest the lowest height we've got there is 1,700, and that's probably on a demo, um, or 1,800 feet. Um, David, what happened there? What talk us through that scenario? Just the facts, man. If you want to. Let's, um, they can't unmute themselves, Chris. Yeah. It's fine. No. Um, we had some random people unmuting themselves. It, so let's just run through this. So... Um, I probably should up my range. It's just a number that I've always had for a long time now. Um, Stefan Purcell asks, communication, by the way, between, between jump master and pilots, firstly at the top or pre-beefed by DJ control? Not quite sure what that question means. Sorry, dude. Um, Katie wore her face mask the other day just on the ground. It fogged up her glasses. So she's expecting it to fog up her goggles more and may need removing under canopy to be able to see. Yeah, fair play. Um, if you've got a full face that you haven't got goggles, um, then yeah, absolutely bear that in mind. Be ready for it. Um, I think I'm intrigued. I think my visor is going to fog in the plane. So make sure your visor is clean. Clean it before you go to the drop zone. Put some anti fog stuff on the inside. Uh, I've also drilled some holes in my visor. Not, not, not specifically for the face mask, but like I was having problems with my visor fogging up. So I just drilled a few holes in the bottom of your visor and um, that reduces the risk of it happening yeah don't do that with an impact rated though because then it will make it null and void cool um so a couple of things here and i think we're going to call that draw that to a close um jill says um there's a very historic thing about when you learn to skydive and what numbers you're valid with i've you know, I've been jumping 15 years um we used to deploy at 2000 feet that was everything we break away at 4000 feet um, you de sorry, deploy at three to be open for two and that's just what I grew up with in the first eight years of skydiving you know? um, and that's just a very thing so then 1500 feet is that's what I guess so that's where it's come from and maybe I need to re, re look at that again uh, and work on that David said he spoke to the guy at Cyprus he said if you're going to two mess with the AD fire height use it you parachute landing area offset function uh, might need a bit more information on that yeah is that uh, there there's um, Brian Germain's put like a really simple way of like a really good idiot's guide of um of copying it through and um, that's what i use every time i do it is it, it is a little bit kind of like pressing in you know, like a super it's not a super complicated sequence but you have to get it right otherwise it won't let you do it and you have to do it right a number of times um before it will change but doesn't that um, mean that it resets every day uh no 
it's it's logged it's locked in there for all the time even using the parachute landing area offset function oh no sorry that, sorry no. Everything. No, no so don't um so my one it's offset continuously until i change it again yeah okay i would recommend using what the the manufacturer recommends for that specific david we'll have a little chat afterwards yeah. cool so thank you very much for the questions we're going to run through the random generator now i've got cheers for the fairy liquid comment mark i'll do it got 48 people here first person to win a prize kellyanne hey darling congratulations second person number 17 david craig good questions number five richard owen oh should we run these down <laughs> first. um number do you say you making him off the list first pardon you say you should have taken richard owen off the list no first. no no no. i should be writing these down as in which who who won what in what order um, say and nice. we, said we had 47 so we've got five prizes jose videra nice one dude thanks for joining um sweet so those are the five people who um oh i didn't share my screen sorry you missed the whole excitement of it oh damn it um okay so those are the five people that won prizes there's also a prize for your best photo from uh packing at home send us your photos tag one jump one tree or um hashtag safety hour so thank you to extreme simbi suits and visionary for those prizes thank you to you all for attending thank you for being here investing in yourself and supporting us and trees for the future we really appreciate it um i want to thank the following people for suggesting content for this class i stuck something up on facebook uh cat brown andy ford jake john sun and soap and justin gum billy payne mikhail baskov janine bondin Matt Zucker, Fiona Mayburn, Ian Beatty, David Craig, Kim Myers, Tracy Bohm, Robin Dean. Thank you so much. You can contact Chris using info at visionary.uk. That's info at V-I-S-I-O-N-A-I-R-I.uk. Or check out Visionary online uh, on their website or on Facebook, probably best uh, for future events around Europe. I'm at briancumming.com and you can hear my interviews with amazing skydivers, uh, their advice and their histories at Radio Skydive UK. Um, you shortly receive an email asking for feedback. In fact, I can copy and paste the link right now into the review. There you go. If you could, it's only six questions, but only one is required. Feel free to skip the other five if you want. Uh, feedback really does help. On Wednesday, you'll get an email from me with the class notes, the links to any sources we've referenced in the videos, and the link to this class. So you can watch it on Catch Up, and you can watch the Brian and Chris show again and again and again. Uh, next week's class is with Dennis Pratt from Hayabusa. Since joining the team, they have been four-way FS world champions three times and indoor four-way FS world champions three times as well. I felt he was best placed to present a class about body position. And he says there are five things you need to know about the perfect FS body position. And I'm not going to argue with him. Thank you to everyone who's booked on. If you haven't, you can grab that at the same place you've got this class. With Dennis's class, you can sit back on your sofa at home and become a more skilled skydiver. Who doesn't want to be a better skydiver? And you don't even need your trousers on 8 p.m. next Monday. Please help us spread the word so we can carry on providing coaching like this. Please tell your friends. Thanks to Chris for his brain dump. Um, thank you to the sponsors of this class, uh, Extreme, Simbi and Visionary. Thank you to you for being here. Investing in yourself is something that people don't do enough of. But as Lizzie told me yesterday, safety isn't expensive. It's priceless. Now, I normally close with a line, I hope you learned something, but actually I don't. I hope you were reminded of something you already knew but had forgotten. I hope you had fun. I hope I'll see you next week. Blue skies, folks. Chris, say goodbye. See you guys. See you at the D-Z soon. Looking forward to getting back in the air with you all.